Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 197, recorded on July 11th, 2021. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. During a virtual presentation streamed to the public, the NextCloud team announced NextCloud Hub 22, the second major launch this year. During the presentation, CEO and founder Frank Karlacek made the case that NextCloud solves complicated cloud privacy and legal issues in an ideal way. Um, and, but this is exactly what we want to solve with NextCloud. So NextCloud is the only solution that provides you with all these collaboration communication features that we need like in our world as it is today and it will be in the future after the pandemic. But we provide the security, we make everything GDPR compliant, um, there is no vendor login, uh, we don't sell any data to advertisers, obviously. So in our opinion, Nextcloud is actually the solution for this post-pandemic world, but in a good way, respecting privacy and security of the users. And of course, the stream focused on the release of Hub 22 and its many new features. Circles is one of the features that caught our attention. If you live in the Nextcloud ecosystem, they enable powerful tools to help curate the information you see coming in and define for the users who they can work with because they are user-defined groups that make it easier to manage those teams and make it simpler to define who you can share files with or assign tasks to, and of course, create chat rooms with. Hub22 makes the integrated chat and task workflows even more helpful, letting you easily share project decks into a chat room or quickly turn a chat message into a task. They're also integrating with several document signature backends, making it easy to sign documents right inside Nextcloud. That does sound nice. And indeed, there are also some improvements that landed for Nextcloud Mail, features like improved threading, email tagging, and support for C filtering. There's also collectives, which looks like something I'd like to play more with. You can kind of think of collectives as a knowledge base with management tools built into Nextcloud. Collectives has full text search, document embedding, and access to knowledge is managed with user defined groups through circles, tying it all together. I'm seeing circles everywhere in this release, Wes. More and more, though, I think what Nextcloud is doing here is, is really building organizational glue. And they're building a compelling group of collaboration tools that give you an environment where it all connects together. And a company like Jupiter Broadcasting that really hasn't like sunk super deep into some Office 365 or super deep into Google Apps, I kind of find this appealing because we need a little bit of project management. We need a chat interface. It could, it could replace several tools. And it's taken a lot of releases for these collaboration tools to kind of all come together as they have now in Hub 22. But in listening to their stream and looking at the features of this release, it seems to me that the work from home move last year seems to have given the NextCloud team a whole new set of momentum. Well, from creating things to destroying things, a lot happened this week in the open source world. We told you we would keep an eye on the Audacity fork situation and this week, it appears the fork hype slowed its roll a bit when the maintainer of one of the more popular forks stepped down over claims of physical harassment. The trouble began when the quintessential free software audio editor changed ownership hands back in May. Days after that oddly handled acquisition announcement, the company proposed telemetry be added to the project and announced the enforcement of a contributor license agreement. While the company seemed to listen and respond to feedback, many were still shocked by the initial overreaches. Then came changes to the privacy agreement, which excluded users under the age of 13, a perhaps questionable move, possibly even running afoul of the GPL. And the response to all of these moves were entirely predictable. The project was forked multiple times since these announcements. Audacity's Flatpak maintainer quickly jumped into action and blocked the Flatpak version's network access. Even though the telemetry hadn't even been added to Audacity yet, at least in the shipping version, the Flatpak maintainer wanted to ensure that users were going to be protected, so he just shut it off. And since the latest round of, well, frankly, easily preventable public blunders by the Muse group, the Audacity project has been forked more than 50 times, including the Tenacity project. Created by the GitHub user known as Cookie Engineer, it's this fork that attracted the attention of 4chan, resulting in what Cookie Engineer claims is real-world harassment, and thus his abandoning of the project. Yeah, okay, so the, the whole thing, what started all this alleged harassment, was a disagreement over the new project's name. Yep. 
So, of course, they couldn't use Audacity, right? That's owned by the Muse Group now. So Cookie Engineer ran a poll to find a new name. Well, 4chan caught wind of this poll and thought it would be hilarious to ensure that Sneedacity, a reference to The Simpsons, won that poll. Then, when Cookie Engineer deleted the poll and picked Tenacity as the new name, well, that didn't go over well. The initial response from 4chan members, though, seemed rather reasonable, actually. They just forked the Audacity project themselves and named it Sneedacity. All right. Yeah, but things didn't stay there, Wes. Things could not just be left alone. The two forks could not live on in their, in their own in peace. Uh, now, there is no way for Wes and I to verify these claims, but still, Cookie Engineer claims that 4chan members took things considerably farther by including physical harassment with a butterfly knife, which, if true, would be considered an illegal weapon in Germany. And after that incident, the developer took to GitHub and announced that he was stepping down from the project. While a search of the forum shows no evidence of Cookie Engineer's address being shared, nor calls for physical violence, there were several calls for action to see him banned from GitHub. Also of note, the 4 chaner responsible for creating Sneedacity seems to have been targeted as well. As for the Tenacity project, it will likely appoint a new maintainer, should anyone still want the job. Yeah, it's a hard job in multiple, multiple ways. Uh, so things are going to take a little while to shake out. And if you're looking for an alternative to Audacity right now, well, then I recommend you check out Osin Audio for a fantastic single track audio editor, a real gem out there. And then, of course, there is our favorite audio editor of all time, and that's Reaper, which works great on Linux, and they even make a version that would run on the Raspberry Pi. And, of course, an honorable mention for the Ardour project, a feature-rich and open-source digital audio workstation. Another entirely predictable story, but one we've all been dreading, is this week the news broke, depending on how you measure it, that Microsoft Edge has beat Firefox to become the third most popular browser in the world. In recent months, the pair have been neck and neck, but Microsoft's browser has now pulled ahead in what seems to be a clear lead. Figures for June suggest Microsoft Edge now holds 3.4% of the browser market, while Firefox has slipped to 3.29, continuing a downward trajectory that has seen the browser either lose or just maintain market share in 10 out of the last 12 months. The trend, unfortunately, seems clear. This recent change pushes Edge into the third position in the browser rankings, behind only Chrome at a lofty 65%, and then Safari at 18%. Things have definitely been picking up momentum for Edge since last summer the browser's market share has more than tripled. Now, marketing obviously plays some role in the increased adoption, and that's the angle that Microsoft is really going to lean into for this story. But I can't help but just notice that it was last month that Microsoft began rolling out Edge to all Windows PCs via Windows Update. That had to expand the install base, likely by millions, almost overnight, which I think is why you are now seeing Edge push ahead in the numbers this month. Now you've definitely got it on your machine, and beyond that, Microsoft is doing everything in its power to encourage users to actually abandon the old Internet Explorer in favor of this new Edge going so far as removing support for Microsoft 365 web apps and automatically launching certain pages in the new browser. And of course, Safari is the default browser on iOS, which is clearly pretty hard to compete against. One can't help but feel like it was kind of naturally just going to shake out like this. When these big platform owners are exerting the leverage of their big platforms to drive user adoption to their browsers... How could an independent browser like Firefox even hope to compete? Linode.com slash LAN. Linode started in 2003 as one of the first companies in cloud computing, three years before AWS and other enterprise providers. And when you go to linode.com slash LAN, you can get $100 in credit for 60 days on a new account. Linode's independently owned, and they founded on a love for Linux and open source technologies. They also love the community that surrounds Linux. Linode is making our Jupiter Colony reunion road trip possible, with meetups in Salt Lake City and Denver, and more along the way, all powered by Linode. Everything we've built since Jupiter Broadcasting went independent 
is hosted on Linode. And if we ever run into troubles, or if you ever run into any troubles, Linode comes with amazing 24-7 customer support by phone or ticket, along with hundreds of guides and tutorials to help you get started on your projects. Linode is part of our team now. Behind the scenes, they're what makes what we do possible. If it weren't for these very advertisements right here, you'd never know because Linode just runs smooth. It's nice and buttery smooth, you might say. It's just fast, it's reliable, and the experience is great. The dashboard is sharp and easy to use, and they have everything you might want to get started quick if that's your preference. And they have S3 compatible object storage, cloud firewall, simple one-click application deployments, and super fast networking. With 11 data centers around the world, you can pick something close to you or your users and use our $100 to performance test your network. Aren't you just a little curious how it might hold up? Linode has tutorials to teach you how to install iPerf and use its commands to diagnose and test your network performance. And you know, 66% of companies save money in a mixed alternative cloud environment. Providers like Linode can help you scale up like never before. They can be part of your multi-cloud strategy. That's why you gotta check it out for yourself and take advantage of that $100. So go right now to linode.com slash LAN. Get that $100 60-day credit on your new Linode account and support the show. That's linode.com slash LAN. Linux.ting.com. If you're sick of overpaying for your sales service, go see how much you could save and then get $25 off at Linux.ting.com. Ting can help you save money because they're an MVNO or a mobile virtual network operator. That means Ting Mobile customers get the same access as customers of the big guys, but with better customer service at a much lower cost. With Ting Mobile, you get the same coast-to-coast -coast coverage you might with, say, the big networks you're familiar with, but you just pay less. And Ting's plans are simple and straightforward, like their new Set 12 plan, which gives you 12 gigabytes of data with unlimited talk and text for $35 a month. And you know a good family plan is hard to find? Well, they have plans that address this. You add as many lines as you like, it's just 10 bucks a line, and every line has unlimited text and calls. How trouble-free is that? And then you share a pool of data. And it doesn't really matter how much you want. You can pick the right plan for you that works. Two, 20, a lot more. There's gonna be something that matches up with you. And every Ting plan comes with their award-winning customer service with nationwide LTE and 5G coverage and the freedom of no contract ever. It's simple to switch to Ting. Pretty much any phone will work with Ting because of that network support. So just head over to linux.ting.com. Check your current phone out, create an account, pick the plan that's right for you, and then Ting will send you a SIM card. You pop that in your phone and you get activated in minutes. Cutting your phone bill in half has never been easier with Ting's great new plans. It's the next generation of Ting Mobile. It's here. Go see how much you could save and then take $25 off. Linux.ting.com. Thanks to Ting for supporting Linux Action News and thanks to everybody who makes it possible for us to give these shows away for free by visiting linux.ting.com. And now for a few stories from our Kernel Corner. Starting with Fedora's Kernel 513 Test Week, which is happening right now. Sunday, July 11th through Sunday, July 18th, 2021. Refer to the wiki page we have linked in the show notes for links to the test images you'll need to participate. Content production pros have been watching this next feature with a lot of interest. It's low latency USB audio, and it looks to be in pretty good shape to land in kernel 514, thanks to some hard work by a subsystem maintainer from SUSE. The goal is to reduce the latency of USB audio during audio playback. These improvements have been successfully tested with Pulse Audio, Jack, Pipewire, and other user space software. Now, the work to reduce this latency was sent in last week along with some other patches. But Linus Torvalds ended up discovering that work hung one of his systems, so he reverted the problematic code. But the developers have submitted new patches as of Friday. They seem to have those fixes in there along with the work to reduce that latency in the USB audio driver. So far, the pull request has landed without any comments by Linus, and it appears to be in good shape to ship this time around. The Rust for the Linux Kernel project, sponsored by Google, is moving right along. A new set of patches submitted to the kernel mailing list summarizes the progress of the project, which aims to enable Rust to be used alongside C. And that progress is significant. 
Both the ARM and RISC-V architectures are now supported, and Microsoft's Linux Systems Group hopes to submit some select Hyper-V drivers written in Rust. Speaking of ARM, they're committing to help the Rust for Linux project on ARM-based systems, and IBM has also contributed some support for the PowerPC architecture. And to top things off, there's a new conference in the works to focus on Rust and the Linux kernel. More details on that in the future. And finally in the kernel corner, the news you've all been waiting for. Samsung has posted patches for a Samba server built into the Linux kernel. This is the fifth round of these patches for KSMBD, which used to be known as SIFSD. And the entire idea is a crazy fast Samba server implemented in the kernel as an SMB3 compliant server. And while that's theoretically interesting, something tells me we're never going to see these 32,000 lines of code get mainlined by Linus. But we'll keep an eye on it. Back in December, in Linux Action News 168, we informed you about Google acquiring Neverware, the company behind a Chromium OS fork called Cloud Ready, which was targeted at regular PC hardware and users looking for a Windows alternative. One thing Cloud Ready's live environment had that Chrome OS does not was a nice graphical installer with a simple to find install OS icon. Now, a recent commit adds a more streamlined installation and icon to Chromium OS proper upstream. And maybe that's kind of to be expected, but to me, the real story here seems clear that Google is preparing Chrome OS for a wider adoption on general PCs. That might also explain some of those native Steam on Chrome OS rumors we've been covering. Indeed. Indeed. I, I, wonder, I wonder how that plays out. So if, if Chrome OS goes mainstream, let's say, makes it easy to install, easy to find, easy to download, super simple, and it installs on just about any PC the Linux kernel supports, how does that impact the Linux distribution market? And new Linux user adoption? I don't know. I mean, it's kind of hard to say at the moment, but it will be fascinating to watch Chrome OS try to compete head-to-head -head both with our beloved desktop Linux and its other commercial operating system brethren. In some ways, though, this might be a cleaner fight than what we've got now with all the subsidized hardware. Yeah, fascinating indeed. I, I think it's, it's interesting to watch Google build all of these irons in the fire, if you will. They have a lot of things that are coming down the pipe that are going to be pretty impactful to Linux. And we're going to keep track of all of it and let you know what happens. So go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. We do have that reunion road trip coming up. Two meetups are scheduled, one in Salt Lake City and one in Denver. Go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting and sign up. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you next week. Next week.